We are, um, let me adjust the lights here for a moment. See if I can get this to work a little bit. Um, today we're going uh, across the channel to London, which will emerge in the beginning of the 19th century as the largest city in the world and will be so until 1925. In fact, uh, between the end of the Roman world and about the 5th century in the West, when Rome had a population of over a million, um, and the 19th century, London will be the only city in the world that will have a population of over a million people. Um, others came close, Istanbul, Beijing, others. But as far as we know, um, London is the only city to hit a million people in 1806. Um, today, China has 92 cities with over a million people in them. And I mentioned that the very first day, but I want to mention it again here because you live in the age of cities. Uh, cities are growing at very rapid rates, uh, very, very rapid, particularly in relation to um, the world in general prior to the 19th century. But we're going to begin today back um, in the Middle Ages, <coughs> um, and um, England has always been, I mean, it's fascinating if you're an American for a number of reasons. We're speaking English right now because of the colonial influence of England on what became the United States, but and a lot of that comes, you know, it, it, it comes through, but like a, like a shirt that's been pulled inside out, it's not the same thing. Um, but England is, is odd for uh, a number of reasons. I mean, they are part of Europe, but they're not part of Europe. They, they still have their own money. They are not uh, part of the Eurozone, uh, their own currency. They're an island. And um, so it's always been, even from the Roman period, it has always been um, a somewhat different, a different sort of universe there. Um, Still today, I think they're terribly confused. You have England, you have Great Britain, you have the United Kingdom, and, um, you know, what are they? Well, the, the, <laughs> the United Kingdom includes England and Wales and Scotland and um, uh, so on and so on, and Northern Ireland, and then Great Britain is only England and Wales, and then England is only England. So it, it's, still, um, it's still very confusing. I mention this because uh, London as a city um, is unique. In of all the cities that we have discussed thus far, uh, and it's unique in that it retains from about the 11th century of the Common Era forward, it retains its autonomy from the crown, its autonomous existence. In fact, it is a corporation. What we're looking at on the screen is um, Londinium, the Roman city. And as was so often the case, the fairly clever uh, Romans uh, built this city exactly where the fresh water of the Thames coming uh, from the left, moving to the ocean on the right of the screen, where that fresh water hits uh, the tidal action. So it's just past tidal action with brackish water, but upstream about where the R, the I, the V, and river that you see is actually fresh water. Uh, when you get past uh, on the right, uh, as it exits, you are in salt water. And this is uh, very important because, in fact, um, it is where you could construct a fairly major port. Um, so the port was here on the right, um, even in the Roman period, as we see here. And um, it uh, was important because of the import-export, particularly the export economy that, London, that England developed, Britannia, the old Roman province of Britannia, uh, primarily for wool, uh, very, very high-quality wool, which was highly sought after, still is today, and, um, and some tin and other minerals that were mined there by the Romans. Now, Londinium was not a, the capital of, of the Roman province of Britannia. That was York. And after the Anglo-Saxon Anglo invasions 
the capital moved to Winchester, what is now the city of Winchester. Uh, and it would not be until William the Conqueror in the 11th century um, that, in fact, London would sort of regain uh, its major importance, because at that point, you begin to develop this export economy again. Remember that William was actually a Norman um, from what is now part Normandy, and his cousins were in Sicily. And you begin to see um, sort of um, uh, England emerging as a very important sort of um, uh, power, naval power, uh, when the technology associated with uh, transport was essentially waterborne. Um, England was a nation of shipbuilders, and still is to some degree. Um, the, the, um, in fact, there is no place on the island further than 60 miles from the ocean. That's an astonishing thing. Further than 60 miles. That's from here to Athens, Georgia. Um, no point on the island closer, further away than 60 miles. And what that meant was that you had access to a number of ports. And um, as trade began to develop and so forth, the city of London, the port of London, became um, extremely important. In fact, much of the tax on import-export duties actually flowed to the crown, and as a result, um, maintaining their autonomy was actually seen by, uh, by the king as being in his own best interest. And so um, they were granted uh, the right under crown law uh, to actually form a, a, an autonomous corporation, a municipal corporation. They were the first and only city in England uh, at the time, and it would not be until the colonial era that you would see cities like Philadelphia following suit, forming an autonomous corporation. All cities today in the United States are such autonomous corporations. They have their own mayor. They have their own board of aldermen or city council. They govern themselves. Many cities have a city tax, et cetera. And um, they are, to some degree, while they're subject to the laws of the state and the nation and so forth, um, they are, to some degree, politically autonomous. And London was unique, in certainly in the 12th uh, century, by having this, um, having this autonomy. Now, not very much of Roman London remains, although every day, every time there's a construction project, something is uncovered. Uh, and the more that is uncovered, the more astonished we are to find, for example, um, you know, the, the wall, the Roman wall, which is near the Tower of London. The Tower of London, by the way, um, will be built right here. Um, the, um, and the city today, by the way, still conforms to this square mile that was the Roman city of Londinium, a Mithraic temple, worship of Mithras, this Persian god that was so popular in Rome in the second century, popular with the army, firemen, people like that, uh, was discovered and excavated um, around 2000, just 13 years ago. So... Um, much of it is conjectural, but we can now begin to piece together from the fragments that have been discovered. Uh, and like everything else, um, it is not surprising that the Cardo and Decumanus are more or less still visible within the pattern um, of the streets that we find in London today. Um, this street that we see exiting here to the left uh, is Oxford Street. It will be straightened out right in here. We'll come to that. And um, the forum, the location of the forum is conjectural because we haven't discovered anything there yet. Here you see uh, the Tower of London, which is, of course, a fort originally that is protecting the port. You'll notice a number of ships here. These are the docklands that we see here. Now, what this meant is that then the crown actually developed the second city. And that city was the city of Westminster. So what we have in London today, most of London is still Westminster. You'll see it written on the side of the... Uh, you'll see it in the zip code, the addresses. It'll say W2, and that is Westminster 2. 
So the area around here, this is this town of Westminster that developed as the royal city, and the town here developed as the autonomous um, corporation, municipal corporation of the city of London with its own board of aldermen and its own lord mayor and so forth and so on. However, much of the tax um, that the, uh, much of the revenue flowing to the crown uh, was in fact coming from export duties that were import and export duties, but mostly export um, from, um, from uh, the city of London itself. Now what that meant was that you had this uh, sort of area in between that we see here, the liberties of Westminster. These were grants of land that were given to the nobility, given to the dukes and the counts and so forth, uh, who in return pledged so many men, so many armaments, so many horses, so many troops, and a certain percentage of their revenue from their land uh, to the crown. And in return, they were given uh, grants of land here. Now, this will become important because uh, unlike Rome, where you had the papacy, or um, Paris, where you had the direct activities of the king, um, a very powerful king, uh, here, you actually had a, whole, a patchwork quilt of, 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 of landowners whose primary um, home would be somewhere else. But they would build houses here so that they could be both um, sort of between, literally between, physically between, the activities of the government on the one hand and the, um, the institutions that were associated with the increasing global reach of the English colonial enterprise as it emerged in the 17th and 18th centuries, including where we are now. Um, that meant that the, you had to have agents, you had to have lawyers, you had to have accountants. In other words, a sort of what we would call a modern professional class that began to develop uh, in this area here in the west of London. And over here in the east, it remained the working docks, the working ports, and um, even to this day on the BBC, there is a show called The East Enders. Um, there was a song that was popular uh, probably about the time most of you were born. I used to be able to use this because people in the class knew who I was talking about. It was a group called the Beastie Boys or something like that. And they had a song that was called The, East End, the, the West End Girls and the East End Boys, right? And it was sort of um, about these, these wealthy girls living over here who would go over and hang out here with the East End, the East End boys. Um, in any event, the, um, the, uh, this, this developed as wealthy, and this remained until very recently uh, very poor. The, um, it was sort of the blue-collar blue -collar area. Now, what you're looking at right here is actually Buckingham Palace, which will not come as, par as part of the crown colonies until the 17th, or the crown lands until the 17th century. It was actually a grant that was given to the Duke of Buckingham, and he built the house, and then ultimately he backed the wrong horse in the Civil War of 1636, and ultimately it then flipped to the crown, so to speak, backed the wrong horse. He chose the wrong side, crown ultimately. He backed the crown, the crown lost in that Civil War, and then in the Restoration of 1661, the land was then given back to, to, to the crown. Now, this is important because you can imagine then that the connection here between um, Westminster and the, the royal city and um, the, merchant ci the merchant city of London would be very important. And that's where we will focus and concentrate our attention here in the first part of this lecture. This, to this day, is called the Strand. And the Strand, which is the name of the street, actually was constructed on the natural levee of the river. And it ended here as it entered into the city of Westminster at a place called Trafalgar Square. And it emerged from the old city of London right here, just past St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, the Strand would be then the area where, in the Middle Ages, the Knights Templars, right where the arrow is, would construct uh, the temple. And when the Knights Templars and the banking institutions that were associated with it. And when the Knights Templars were dissolved, um, 
it actually emerged as uh, the residences of barristers, lawyers. Now, the English system, the American system is based on English common law, uh, but it's very, very, very different. Um, and actually being admitted to the bar, it was actually a bar. And until you actually had sort of passed an examination and been certified, uh, you could not represent your client, who was typically uh, a wealthy person, nobility and so forth, before the court, uh, because the court was still controlled by the crown. And you literally had to be admitted to the bar, and thus the term barrister. So these lawyers um, began to occupy the area of the temple, and they still do uh, to this day. There we see the Strand as it exits the city of London, and there you see it in red as I've outlined it here on the map of, of the Blome map of uh, 1659. So um, this set a precedent because the, there were two of these, the inner temple the, and the middle temple, and uh, they were built around a courtyard like a monastic foundation, like a collegiate uh, close, cloister, right? Um, and so this set a precedent then for two things. One at the top, Lincoln's Inn, and uh, what we're looking at there at number, uh, at the, the one that's uh, in the middle is, um, is uh, I believe, Covent Garden or Gray's Inn. But, but this set a precedent a sort of physical precedent, very much like in the 19th century and the early 20th century, universities in the United States all sort of adopted this collegiate uh, Gothic architecture style. Georgia Tech did, certainly. Britain Dining Hall, the dormitories over there in this kind of collegiate Gothic. Uh, Duke University, when it was built, it's all collegiate Gothic. And uh, we pretty much got away from that, but there was this period of time when it was all sort of based on uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Those were kind of the models. And Oxford and Cambridge, to some degree, were sort of based upon these monastic foundations, as were um, these inns of court. The inns of court being Lincoln's Inn, Gray's Inn, and so forth, were actually the places where the lawyers lived and worked. They no longer live in the Middle Temple or the Inner Temple, but their offices are there. And it is this precedent that ultimately will form the basis then for a series of speculative real estate developments that will produce this distinctive patchwork quilt that we see spreading across most of London today and will culminate in the 19th century with the biggest one of all, um, which was never actually developed the way it was intended by the Prince Regent, known as Regent's Park. So the precedents, the ends of court, there we see a detailed map showing the, um, the inner temple, the church, um, which was bombed during World War II and then, oops, uh, and then um, rebuilt. And then we see the Middle Temple Hall and the Inner Temple Hall. And then above that, you will see Lincoln's Inn uh, and Lincoln's Inn Fields. Uh, Lincoln's Inn, again, being sort of based upon this, um, this physical model of the temple that we see here, the Knights Templars. And notice where they are in relation to the royal courts of justice. Uh, right there along the strand, there we see the strand, um, and then these will become the model for the first of these residential squares, which will be called uh, Covent Garden. Um, there was a rhyme that was uh, associated with this, Inner Temple Rich, Middle Temple Poor, Lincoln's Inn for Gentlemen, and Gray's Inn for a, and it rhymes with poor, okay? Um, so if you'll notice then, we have in red outline here, beginning here at the east end with the Tower of London, the outline of the old city of Londinium, and then we see the strand coming along here where it enters into the city of Westminster. In 1661, this will flip back over. That's Buckingham Palace right here. And these were the royal grounds that were associated with the Duke of Buckingham's palace. And, and from 1661 forward with the uh, seat of the of, of, the, of the queen, seat of the ki queen today, king of the royal family. Uh, I find the, the sort of royal family, <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing thing. They're sort of like this living museum or something because they have no actual authority or power. That was actually taken away completely by the parliament in 1798. But the Civil War of 1630 
um, to 16 until the restoration, a 30-year period, um, actually resulted in the separation of the king from his head um, very early. So at the very point, in fact, the same year that Richelieu is building his town and consolidating the monarchy in France, you actually have the British cutting the head off their king. And after the restoration in 1661, uh, there is a, 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 the, the king to a substantial degree, the monarch to a substantial degree, becomes a ward of parliament and their authority and power other than sort of ceremonial, you know, riding around in carriages and, and knighting people like Paul McCartney or Elton John or something, um, you know, sort of parachuting out of helicopters with James Bond at the Olympics. It's sort of, um, it's sort of like a living museum of sorts, you know. I, I found it fascinating, actually. Um, and so this area... As it developed, this is Lincoln's Inn, there's the temple, and I want to focus here on this, which is Covent Garden. Um, the Strand, and then the Royal Courts of Justice, which again, the street actually had a bar. You could not actually enter unless you had been admitted past this examination and gotten a, a sort of royal uh, certificate that allowed you to practice law in the Royal Courts of Justice. Look at that building. What a mess. I mean, just amazing. So here we see a detail then of the Temple District, and then you can see how Lincoln's Inn develops in imitation of the physical model or form of the Temple District. And there it is today, still functioning. Uh, the offices of, of lawyers. You can actually Google Lincoln's Inn, and it's a law firm, you know, or Gray's Inn, it's a law firm. And... Um, it's sort of fascinating going there. The um, and you weren't you, you you got to wear silk. That's actually the the critical thing. You you sort of got to wear silk, you know. Um, and they still call it that, silk. Once you had been admitted. So um, here is uh, actually the chambers, and this is actually from the website of Lincoln's End today. And uh, this no enormous sort of open area that's constructed here called Lincoln's End Fields that we see here on the left. Um, now, based on then the, these models of the ends of court, uh, the Duke of Bedford, who was, had been granted a, um, a grant of land, this is actually the strand that we see coming along here, headed toward London. What we're looking at, the Thames is down here. This is actually today Trafalgar Square. And he was granted um, an estate here where he built his house um, and then decided, the fourth Duke of Bedford, decided that he would actually enter into a speculative real estate development because of the demand for housing, that the land could be much more productive if it was converted from sort of pleasure grounds and gardens and so forth um, to, um, to an actual residential development, which would then be attractive to all of the uh, professional class that was growing um, by leaps and bounds at this point in time in the early 17th century. Now, this is the tract of land that he was given, and it was associated for a long time with a convent, and actually the convent had been stripped of its uh, land ownership by Henry VIII, in the 16th century, and had lain fallow until it was granted over to the, uh, that's the convent that we see right here, and thus the term convent or covent, they dropped the N, covent garden, uh, which we see here. This is the house then that was built by uh, the Duke of Bedford. And here we actually see the plan for this uh, square, which is clearly based on these Renaissance precedents. It included... Um, only one building remains from the original development of 1636 um, and, and 1630 to 1635, actually occupied, completed in 1636, and that's St. Paul's Church. That's not the cathedral. It's just another church named St. Paul's, which still exists. The, um, the rest of it actually was never completed because um, an impromptu market began to develop in the center of it, and um, it became sort of this giant swap meet 
The, um, and thus, it was not a very attractive place to live. In fact, Horace Walpole in the 18th century wrote that it was dangerous to walk through at night uh, because of a lot of people who sort of flowed into London seeking work, seeking jobs, both internally moving from the countryside into the city, uh, but also from overseas moving into, uh, because we're at a time here when uh, when, when uh, the British Empire is really on the rise, they are in possession of um, substantial parts of North America. Uh, they had discovered Australia. They were in uh, Central Africa. Um, they were in India um, later, but, but it, it, it's expanding across, across the globe. Uh, and in any event, going back to the 17th century, this then, uh, became not very successful. It wouldn't stop the Duke of Bedford. He would, as we'll see, develop other speculative real estate developments, and to this day, his descendants still operate the Bedford Real Estate Company, which we'll see the opposites of in a moment. Now, the peculiarities, as I said, although we take much from them, our language, some of it anyway, and um, there, many of our legal institutions have their origins and so forth uh, rooted in English common law. The, um, we're very, very different. And one of the things that makes it different is this old distinction between real property and capital. Um, the uh, Duke of Bedford owned the land. And the idea was that you would then lease, you would build a house, and then you would lease it to an occupant for 99 years. And then at the end of the 99-year lease, um, you could either take it back or you could lease it to someone else. That still operates that way today. It's a very peculiar system that probably has its roots back in the um, Roman period that somehow survived through the Middle Ages. But it's very, very different from what we have now. When you own a house, now you own the land. And you can sell the land as though it was part of capital. This is part of the colonial world that makes us a little different. We'll come to that when we talk about colonial cities. Uh, so this was the plan. It was developed by the architect Inigo, like Indigo without the D, Inigo Jones. He was the first uh, British architect to actually uh, travel to Italy and to study the... Um, the sort of Renaissance buildings. England never really had a Renaissance. It sort of went from the Middle Ages to um, the modern world sort of in a very short period of time. It never really had this transition. So um, unlike France, which was heavily influenced, you know, Leonardo da Vinci is buried in France. He was brought to France to the court of Francois I, for example. Um, it's a very different sort of history. Peculiar, uh, strange, um, nice, but strange. Um, so if we look at this, we can clearly see the precedence that Jones used. Um, there was an existing square, Leghorn Square, uh, which had been built uh, with a church sort of uh, facing out onto it. And then there was the Place de Vosges, and I think Covent Garden is sort of a hybrid between these two. I think what he had in mind is Covent Garden. There we see the arcades from that... Um, uh, photograph of 1931, and there we see the arcade of Covent Garden today. It was, uh, a piece of it was bombed in World War II, had to be rebuilt, and um, they built it back. They had the drawings for Inigo Jones, and so they built it back, one wing of it, they built back to, to Jones's, um, Jones's architecture. So he was the first British architect to travel to Italy. But uh, the British got confused. I don't know whether the confusion came from Jones or whether it came just from the peculiarities of the, being on this island over there. But um, one thing for sure, sort of Mediterranean cuisine never made it across the channel until very recently. But uh, the British got confused. And rather than calling this the piazza, this the piazza, they called this the piazza. And as I mentioned earlier, it's still, uh, if you go down to Charleston, South Carolina today, people still call a portico a piazza. And the first time I heard that, I had no idea what they were talking about. But, but so they call this the, the piazza, uh, even though uh, this isn't. So they didn't have a name for this. If this was the piazza, they couldn't call that the piazza. 
They certainly couldn't call it a place because they hated the French. And, um, and so they called it a square. Right? Now, many of these are not squares. Some are ovals, some are trapezoids. They're not squares, but they call it a square. Um, I don't, it's kind of strange. I think only because they couldn't, just to distinguish between this erroneously named arcade, which is, they call Piazza. Uh, this is a drawing of it in 1751. You can notice the market in the center here. And the market stalls here are built roughly where the um, south wing of this was to be uh, constructed. This is a unified facade, but you'll notice here from the flues and the firewalls that these are, in fact, uh, separately owned townhouses. However, the British do not call them townhouses. They have a specific name for it. It's called a terrace house. So, um, uh, again, the first time I heard that, I had no idea what they were referring to until I realized it's what we would call a townhouse. Now, the distinction for the non-architects, and even for the architects, between an apartment and a townhouse is that in the townhouse, you actually have it stacked up vertically so that <clears throat> if, you're, if you own it, you own to the ground. <coughs> if you're leasing it, you're leasing the whole thing. That means it has a kind of built-in front and back, right? And the bedrooms are up above the living areas, and often the kitchen and other kinds of things would be sort of down in the basement. And this has very important urban implications, which uh, long after this sort of unified facade and ground floor arcade based on these Renaissance precedents, built around these open courts similar to Lincoln's Inn, similar to Gray's, sim similar to the temple, uh, actually would be, would be individual buildings that fronted directly on a kind of park-like uh, square, uh, usually planted in the, in the center. So the market developed, thus the, um, the, the whole thing was never actually completed, and it converted actually to office use uh, and not residential, not residential use. There we actually see it uh, as it begins here at 1700. There you see the market sort of developing. Uh, here is where the, that's the house of the Duke of Bedford there, which was torn down. And then here we actually see where the market developed, where that, and eventually taking over the entire thing, so that by the 19th century, they actually constructed a permanent building, a stone building, which still remains today, and was renovated and sort of upgraded uh, in the 1980s. It's um, quite a center of activity, a lot of restaurants and a lot of activity. People go there on a Saturday or a Sunday just to walk around. This is what it looked like then in the, about 1820. Um, we can imagine by looking at some of those Sherlock Holmes movies of late uh, sort of what this may have been like. Actually, I think they did a fantastic job of recreating 19th century London in those movies. They really did. And this is what it looks like today. Now, this piece that we see is to Inigo Jones' design. The rest of it is not. And then this, of course, is built um, in the 19th century to house uh, what was originally primarily a vegetable market, but which actually converts to this kind of shopping mall today. The Apple Store, for example, is right here. So that's where you go to buy um, your Macintosh or your iPhone, designed by Carl Backus, um, who uh, is a Georgia Tech graduate and who in the 1970s actually sat in the early edition of this course. Uh, this is the only thing of Jones that actually remains intact, uh, the little church of St. Paul, which doesn't much function as a church anymore. In fact, I came out of a restaurant here a few years back about midnight and there was something called the London School of Samba. And there were all these people like you're in Rio de Janeiro with this great sort of line snaking around through the church and doing all this kind of stuff. Uh, it was really kind of funny. People beating drums and doing all kinds of things down here. This is what it looks like, the upgraded market, the Apple Store. This is in the arcade here that was restored after World War II. And then this is in the center of the, um, of the market that we see now, antique stores, curio shops, a lot of tourists in there, but it's also used by Londoners as well. Now, in 1666, London was essentially, the West End is down here. So Covent Garden, the Inns of Court, there's the Temple Gardens and so forth right here. Uh, 
um, this is still a medieval city, and um, and it burns. Uh, fire breaks out, and it will burn um, the whole city. In fact, uh, we'll see in a moment the outline of the fire burn the whole thing to the ground. And so there was a lot of um, attention paid to how to build it back. And there were many plans of astronomers, scientists, uh, famous people, uh, architects. This is the plan um, that you probably have seen in your art history textbooks, uh, the plan by Christopher Wren, which is clearly based on these Renaissance principles because by this time, these treatises on the ideal city uh, that have come out of uh, the 1500s and 1600s in Italy have made their way up through France and eventually up through Germany and eventually in Holland and so forth and eventually into England. So the intellectual class, the scientists and the um, lawyers and the, and the sort of better educated class are reading these things. And that becomes important because this is the period of English colonial expansion into the New World. Um, the Spanish colonial expansion had a completely different sort of... Um, um, mindset about things because they were essentially crown and church driven, whereas the English uh, were not. They were sort of driven on speculative basis under royal charters. But there are certain similarities between the English and the French and the uh, and the and the Spanish because they're all reading the same books. You know, they're all reading the same books. If you were to go to um, an architecture school, let's say today in Stuttgart you might be reading the same sort of books that, uh, that uh, you might read here, just in a German translation. And uh, that's, that's to some degree true um, around the world today, um, which has an upside and a downside. In any event, um, you can see that Piazza del Popolo is sort of still the precedent here. This is St. Paul's. Uh, you're sort of entering here through the uh, city, the old city of London, uh, down to this kind of rather Baroque, square that we see here. Wren's plan was never implemented. In fact, none of these plans were ever implemented uh, because why? Can anybody guess why? Just make a wild guess. Why couldn't you implement these plans? Infrastructure, that's a good reason. It was already in place. It was very expensive to move. But um, I've already said it. London was autonomous. Right? So they were a separate corporation, so you didn't have a pope or an archbishop or a king or someone coming in sort of saying, okay, we're going to build these streets here, right? Because you owned all the land, and you just built it back on land that you already owned, right? And that is, uh, so ultimately it kind of got, the buildings are new, but, but it got built back still in its street pattern in its medieval form, partly because of infrastructure, partly because of the legal autonomy uh, that uh, the city of London uh, and the corporation of London maintained. This is the extent of the fire, and it is significant that right here at Lincoln's Inn uh, was a lawyer, uh, a Quaker lawyer uh, named William Penn, who uh, became heavily engaged in the colonial enterprise and would found this colony of Pennsylvania and would design the city of Philadelphia. Right. He witnesses the fire, and so he wants a city that is quite different. Uh, but the fire was significant in other ways, and um, we um, we see here the Robert Hooke, the famous scientist, um, his plan, and the one that I think is ultimately the most influential, although several historians like John Reps disagree with me because the plan was not published until the 18th century, so he says it can't possibly have been influential. But um, Sir Richard Newcourt was part of this sort of intelligentsia in the West End. Uh, they had these clubs, these political clubs and societies and so forth, and they would get together and they would sit around and drink port and discuss how to build a better world or discuss the colonial enterprise in the state of Georgia or something like that. And uh, so we look at this map, I think these people would have been familiar with it, including uh, James Edward Oglethorpe, who would lay out, presumably, the city of, no plan has ever been found of it, the city of Savannah. I say presumably because we don't really know who designed it. 
um, and William Penn, who ultimately laid out Philadelphia. Uh, because there are certain similarities that you see in both Philadelphia, the Central Square and the four wards that we see here, and in Savannah with the individual sort of four blocks here forming this, this cellular unit and a hierarchy of lesser streets and larger streets. And we will come back to this when we get to the colonial cities after the fall break. So here are the land holdings that we see uh, by the 19th century. And uh, just to sort of orient you, Buckingham Palace is down here. The Strand runs along here. The city of London is over here. So this is really the west end going up past Regent's Park. And you can see then who owned what land, the Marquis of Camden, Lord Southampton, the Duke of Bedford, who was sort of the major player. I want to focus in on this area that we see right here because it is the only one of these squares that remains intact from its original design in the 18th century. So the area that is outlined here in red um, that is laying here on the fringe of London as it is growing, and it is growing rapidly, reaching a population by this time probably of around 200,000 people. It's becoming a pretty big place. And there you see um, the Covent Garden, and there you see Lincoln's Inn, and the Duke of Bedford having failed here in Covent Garden on his land, moves up here and decides to give another go. It's a different duke. Now, this is likely to be on an exam, so pay attention. Tottenham Court. This is one of the um, sort of residences that for a brief period of time is actually the royal residence, the Buckingham Palace. of, uh, of um, And so the street that you see coming down into the developed part of the city is called Tottenham Court Road. And it intersects Oxford Street right here, just above my finger, intersects it right here, and a new street will be constructed that straightens this part out that, as it is today. This street today is gone. Um, and there we actually see the land holdings, and if you pay attention to where these uh, property lines are, the streets tend to follow these property lines as they are cut in because it is um, some is owned by... Uh, this person, that's owned, the next one's owned by this person, the next one's owned by that person. So the streets were cut in along the property lines. We can no longer do that by law in the United States, in most places, <coughs> and I think that's a problem, um, which we'll come to at the end of the course. So if we look at this then, what you will see is, um, is a development then of a terrace house complex. Now I want to talk, I've mentioned this twice, and I want to go back and explain what I mean. The, the terrace house is a single family house, what we would call a townhouse. This is the living areas that you see, and you enter directly off the street into a living room and a parlor. Uh, typically, the kitchen is uh, either in the back or uh, down in the basement, and then you have vertical circulation here. So what you have is a single family detached house. Now, the further you go north, the, you know, if you're in the Mediterranean, you have, a very, you have a very good climate, right? So the courtyard is in the center of the house, and the rooms open out to the courtyard, and it's a garden. But if you're in the north, uh, what's the biggest problem? Staying warm in the winter. So the center of the house typically is the hearth. And what that means is, if you look at colonial houses in Massachusetts, for example, wooden houses, you will have a hearth in the center with an H shaped fireplace so that it could throw heat in two directions. And thus you would enter um, into a kind of vestibule and then you would have two rooms on either side and eventually you would have what was called a four, four over four, four rooms, uh, sort of two chimneys with these fireplaces that, that, well what that means is is that if you take a single family house like you have in Atlanta and you attach it, what happens? You lose all the sunlight entering the building on the sides. You only have light coming from the front and the back. And that is, in effect, what a townhouse is, as opposed to the um, apartment building, which is a series of flats, to use the English term, which has a kind of ready-made ability to have ground floor retail. You know, you just plug it right in to the insula because, and we see that in Paris, for example, which adopts the insula type in the 19th, in the 19th century, where you can plug the shoe store or the restaurant or the cafe on the ground floor 
Um, but how do you do that here? You can't, right? So there has to be some other way of accommodating retail and commercial uses uh, within this system of housing types. We'll come to that here in a moment, if I can get this to advance. Well, I'm frozen up. Everything is frozen. Sorry about that. There we go. So um, one more thing about this. So you had this kind of public side, and then you had this private side, and the backyard was today, we would consider a backyard to be a, a place of pleasure, right? You might have a dog. You might have a barbecue grill. Uh, but at this point in time, the backyard was associated with work. This is where you uh, rendered fat. This is where you chopped meat. This is where you cut the heads off the chickens. Um, all these kinds of things, including cesspits, because London, as it grew, outgrew its infrastructure and did not have encapsulated sewers other than the ones that um, the Romans had constructed, which will become a real problem in, for public health in the, in the 19th century. And thus, in the back was where you stored the horses, and then above that, um, your um, driver or your servant lived in this carriage house. So, again, this is out front, fine silk, and in the back, tuberculosis. This opened off of an alley, <coughs> which was called a muse. We'll come to that in a moment. The, um, the um, heights of buildings were after the fire were regulated because one of the reasons that they could not put the fire out is they didn't have equipment, ladders and things, big enough to get up to fight the fire. So um, depending upon the width of the street, they passed a law that limited the heights of these buildings uh, based upon the width of the street. We're running out of time here, so uh, let me come to a stopping point, which might as well be here, um, and we'll pick this back up on Wednesday of next week. Wednesday of next week. <laughs>